Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk on territory long inhabited by indigenous tribes, including the Wichita, Kiowa, Osage, Comanche, and Kickapoo. At home, I live on the traditional land of the Duwamish people in a city named after their venerable leader, Chief Seattle, and I support the Duwamish tribe's ongoing struggle for U.S. federal recognition. Thank you for honoring these indigenous tribes with me today. Um, today I am speaking on my own behalf and I won't be discussing anything specific to Amazon that isn't public. At Amazon, my focus was on designing worldwide interactive map box type base maps at 21 zoom levels for mobile and desktop uses. Because everyone is familiar with using maps on their phones, people take the making of maps for granted. So I often got questions that started with, can't you just... <laughs> so this is the real title of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> this came up a lot. So I developed a presentation to help people understand the complexities of cartography. Over the years, I gave this talk to managers, designers, engineers, and product managers. And in 15 to 20 minutes, it laid the groundwork for more productive conversations about maps. By the end of my tenure, a recording of my talk was a required onboarding step for new hires on a couple of engineering teams. So I'm going to give you that presentation now. It's targeted at non-cartographers, so the details won't be surprising or new. But I hope the way I've organized the concepts and the examples I use can help you proactively prepare your colleagues for these kind of conversations. All right. This map, like all maps, is designed to be interpreted quickly and intuitively. A well-designed map functions efficiently without the user being consciously aware of the details. Let's look into what goes, goes into making that happen. You're probably expecting this talk to cover things like color choices and fonts, but I'm actually not going to talk much about those. When making a map, there are a lot of data classifications to do and a taxonomy to create before you get to the typical design work. And that's what I'll be talking about. So vector tiles contain layers of data. Some examples of those layers are listed here. Things like water and land use, buildings, points of interest. A style sheet for rendering the map has about 150 to 200 layers. So your first question is probably, why does the style sheet have to have so many layers? There are a couple reasons, multi-layer visual effects and data classes. I'll walk through each of these. Let's start with multi-layer visual effects. For this, I'll show you two examples. First, here's a motorway drawn with a simple line. But let's make it better. First. I'll add a thick casing to show that it is separated from other roads. Then I'll also give the road underneath the casing to give it better contrast with the background. Next, I'll add a center line to the motorway to suggest multiple lanes. And what if part of it is a bridge where it crosses that other road? We need a shadow to show the Z level. There, much better and easier to quickly understand, but that requires several style sheet layers to create. Here's a, uh, a second example, a river drawn as a simple blue line. Now let's give it a bit of depth. It's a subtle change, but this effect adds a highlight and a shadow layer offset a little bit, and visually the river sinks downward, making the topography clearer. Let me show you that one more time. Plain and sunken. In addition to multi-layer visual effects, Data classes affect how many layers there are in the map. Within each data layer, there are different classes of data. Here are two simple examples of classes within a tile layer. First, land cover, which is the top row, and land use, the bottom row. So two data layers become eight style sheet layers. In the place layer, there are different classes. Cla um, cities are ranked using an algorithm that takes into account things like population as well as the relation to nearby cities. So I use that rank value to develop seven, seven classes of cities that make, se that make sense worldwide. There are also things like continents, neighborhoods, and things like that. So the ridiculously small diagram on the left is from open map tiles. 
Uh, it shows the possible values for classes and subclasses of points of interest in an OM, OSM based tile data. After deciding which points of interest were relevant for a certain use case, I included those and categorized them into a few categories. So there's a layer for each of those. From the transportation name layer, we not only get road names, which are pretty straightforward, but also highway shields. The logic for these can be complicated and varies by country. Every time we added a new country, I researched how roads are tagged in the source data, crosswalked that to our existing road classes, and created shield images as needed. Often, a few sizes of shield are needed to accommodate long numbers. Within the transportation data layer, there are 10 classes of road line, but it's a little more complicated than that. For example, consider two road classes, motorway and primary road. Here's how they look when they're on the surface, when they're surface streets. Bridges need to be displayed on top of those with shadows, and tunnels underneath in a way that makes it clear they're underground. Each road class can also be designated a ramp, which needs to be visually related but narrower. And ramps can be bridges. They can also be tunnels, but in this case, it looks okay to have ramp tunnels drawn the same as the regular tunnels. So this kind of variation happens for almost all of the road classes. So you can see how layers quickly proliferate. And so now you understand why there are so many layers in the map compared to the map data tiles. Next, I wanna tell you more about how I order all of these layers. That is to say, deciding the order that the layers will appear in the style sheet. There are two main factors visual layering, and label collision priority. Let's talk about visual layering. That means layering things so they look clearest to the eye. We'll start simple. With two layers, parks and water. It would seem to make sense that you would layer parks on top of water, sort of logically makes sense. Um, but here's how that would look. Uh, park boundaries often include rivers and extend into water bodies. Uh, so it's not the greatest visual experience. So we wanna switch the order which looks much better. Let's talk about another example, buildings and tunnels. As before, it would make sense to draw buildings on top of tunnels because that's how things are stacked in real life. And often that looks okay, like in the Seattle example. But when there are a lot of buildings or large buildings, like in downtown Boston, the tunnel is so obscured by buildings that it's hard to see. The connectivity of the road network is unclear. So if that's important to us, Let's put the tunnels on top instead. Now we can see the road, but small buildings are completely obscured. Finding those houses in the Seattle side would be more difficult. So a better solution is needed, more layers. Here's my solution. Under the tunnel is the building shadow and building fill. On top of the tunnel is the building outline and a new semi-transparent building fill layer. So now all the, layer, all the features are visible and clear and you can see what's happening at a glance. County lines are an interesting example that will illustrate some of the trade-offs that need to be made. Here's an issue someone might notice on the map. Hopefully it's visible on the screen. This is off the east coast of the UK. County lines are on top of the water there and they add some unnecessary visual noise. I don't like the way this looks. That's because the county line layer is drawn over the water layer. Here's another place where county lines are visible on top of water. I'm going to use this location in New Jersey to walk you through the decision process about layering. So uh, before we start, make sure you can see where the county lines are. There's one that goes down the river there, and then also one along the, the Belleville Turnpike. So those are the county lines. I've darkened them a bit so they're more visible. Okay, so we've decided that, let me go back to show you how it originally looked. Um, we've decided that we don't like the county line's on top of water, so let's put it under the water. There we go. But now it's completely gone. Why is that? Well, it's because there's a road layer in the style sheet, many of them, in fact, and in this location, the roads and the county line coincide. With this layering, the roads are covering up the county line. We wanna see them when they're on land. So we conclude that the county line must be above the roads, because that's important to us. So let's try drawing the county line above the road and below the water. I'll do that one more time. You can see maybe what happened to my map. Here's first and second. We've lost our bridges, which clearly need to be drawn on top of the water. 
So we also conclude that roads must be drawn on top of the water. So let's review. The county line must be above the road. The road must be above the water. And therefore, county lines must be drawn above the water. It's unavoidable. And so we're, whoop, so we're left with the least good option. <laughs> uh, that's, these got out of order. That was the next slide. <laughs> All right. Let's do another simplified example. Suppose my map contains these layers in this order. These are all labels, road names, park names, and points of interest. Uh, a quick technical note, um, if, in case you're familiar with how map box style sheets actually work, in the style sheet, the order is actually the opposite of this because the renderer reads from top to bottom. But for this presentation, I've reversed it uh, because it's easier to see and understand it as sort of a visual stack. Anyway. I chose this layer order because when navigating, road names are the most important, followed by parks, then points of interest. Keep in mind, these points of interest in the base map, uh, they're only background context. They're not what the user is actually looking for. Whoa, hold on, there we go. Somehow some of them got out of order. Okay, um, so the renderer parses the style sheet and renders the point of interest labels first. Then it renders park names, and the colliding point of interest disappears. Finally, road names are rendered, and the park label is bumped off. At this zoom level, roads are the most important feature for navigation, so I've prioritized it. Of course, as you zoom in and there's more room, the labels return in priority order. First parks, then points of interest. So for all labels, I need to consider which are more important and which are less important. This leads me to an important concept called visual hierarchy. Ironically, this is my least visual slide, but I think this quote from the uh, GIS and TU body of knowledge is a good definition. If I'm giving this talk to engineers, I let them read this and then I move on. If I'm talking to UX designers, I add that I know they're already familiar with the concept of visual hierarchy, uh, but then I explain one key difference between cartography and UX design. UX designers control the placement of all the elements in their designs. In cartography, it's more like Map features are tossed in a bucket, jumbled up, and dumped out at random. I have little to no control over the features that I'm designing, so I have to consider how, that every type of feature might be next to or even on top of any other when I'm developing my visual hierarchy. With a successful visual hierarchy, a map communicates quickly and intuitively. Now, this is a different type of layering than I was talking about earlier. It's more of a logical layering, a way of telling the map user which features are more and less important. Of course, everything on the map is important or it shouldn't be included. Every design decision I make for a map style must take the visual hierarchy into account so that features are not inadvertently seen as too important, which is distracting, or not important enough, which slows the reading of the map. Here's a summarized version of the visual hierarchy of a map style at zoom level 17. I'll walk you through an illustration of this in a minute. But first, I want to make sure you know this is a summary of a longer and more detailed list. When designing the visual hierarchy of the map, I think of it like determining the order in which I want the user to notice map features. I'm going to walk through an example in slow motion. In this case, the user is a driver looking for a destination and viewing the map at zoom level 17. That's zoomed in pretty far, so we can assume the driver is close and looking for a specific address. So I'm going to walk you through how they might see the map in slow motion. Sorry for the delay, everyone remote. Uh, I'm going to walk you through what happens in a map user's eyes and brain as they look at the map. And here's the full map. So as I said, this process that we went through is what happens in the map user's eyes and brain uh, as they're trying to find a specific destination on the map. I'll do it one more time. That's not how it works. Okay, here we go. This is, as you're zeroing in on your location, you notice the things higher in the visual hierarchy first. Now, of course, this is just for zoom level 17. The visual hierarchy is actually different at each zoom level, 
because at each Zoom level, there's a different number of possible features to display and different use cases. So now you know why there are so many layers in the map style sheet and some of the factors I consider when deciding layer order and the critical role that visual hierarchy plays. Everything I just covered acts as a foundation and on top of that logical structure, I can finally make specific, desi specific design choices about colors and widths and things like that. In short, everything on the map affects everything else, visually, technically, and logically. And so that's the end of the talk that I give to the... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I hope, this, I hope this helps you, cartographers, to have more productive conversations with your colleagues. You're welcome to borrow from my presentation and make it yours. Um, I won't be taking questions now because we're short on time, but grab me uh, in person or in Slack. Thank you. <laughs>